I'm Chris Preston. And I'm Brad Zimmerman. Welcome to Street Check, the best two-person podcast in the history of Cabot Wealth Network, which has been delivering investing advice uh, to individual investors for more than 50 years. Brad, uh, this time last year, I think you were about to head to Japan, right? Uh, when we did our last episode of September or early October. Um, and I asked you, who, uh, which Phoenix area, this is where you live, uh, team was going to win the most games in October? The Diamondbacks, which were on the brink of making the playoffs, we weren't sure. Uh, your your beloved uh, Arizona Cardinals, uh, or the I think did we did we throw the Coyotes in there? Maybe not. Uh, they're got R.I.P. Uh, yeah. And Suns. I can't remember what your answer was, but the correct I think your answer might have been the Diamondbacks. I can't remember. I think I think it was, um, and they ended up going to the World Series. They yeah. we weren't even sure they're going to make the playoffs. They won eighty four games. And they made they not only made the playoffs, beat the Dodgers, beat someone else, Phillies, went to the World Series, magical run. This year they won yes. eighty nine games. They did even better. They did not make the playoffs. Unfortunately, they came on the last day and they did not make it. No, and they had the the best run differential or the most runs scored in the MLB, which was yes. the story of the season. They were putting up numbers, but pitching was pretty bad all year. It was not there yeah. when we needed it. The big thing, though, is like they had an opportunity to just win some games in the stretch, and they did not. They tried to back into it like they pretty much did last year, and they failed. So I was rooting for like a doubleheader sweep in which, oh yeah, yeah, that's right. Had had either team won the first game, they would have Braves Mets on Monday. Yeah, exactly. So whoever the winner of the first game was, uh, I think, pretty much locked in. Um, yeah, the winner of the first game was in, but then they had no incentive to play hard the yes. second game, and they didn't. Uh, Mets yeah. won the first game in dramatic fashion and then uh, did not play hard the second game, and the Braves made it too. Um, yeah, it, we know. Have been all, you know. All the hot dogs you made in spring training, uh, flipping the fortunes <laughs> for the Diamondbacks? So that, they got was that, that wasn't just for the Diamondbacks, was late. it? Late. No, it was for, for the Rangers and Royals was the stadium that I was at. Uh, I see. So I did my best to engineer some like late onset food poisoning, but no, no success there. <laughs> Although yeah. the, that would have just impacted crowd members and not, not the teams I suspect, but right. uh, I don't know. They, they had a little bit of hype behind them, but it did not feel like last year's like Cinderella run was the start of something meaningful. They, their bullpen was terrible. Had been, has been terrible. No. Yeah. What are you going to do? At least yeah. I have the Cardinals to root for. They're, looking at pretty average pretty well average for them so bad yeah and sun season starts soon uh right nba season starts pretty soon uh, yes yeah. it'll be something um I, uh, know, sports the bane sport. of every arizona resident's existence when was the last championship again it was diamondbacks in 01 yes. right i mean yeah. that's a very famous one at least beating the yankees seven games but well, it's also 24 almost years. 24 years now yeah <laughs> yeah it's a long time um okay let's move on to the market uh tell people what we're going to talk about today so we are going to talk about jobs numbers which uh big news this week obviously we are going to talk about the abbreviated dock workers strike <laughs> and we are going to talk about and i'm drawing a blank what's our number three number three uh numbers? nike uh, has had a nike. tough job at last well Recently, but also just really for years. So we're just talking about some of the reasons behind that. Yeah. So we're going to talk about Nike and then we are going to have Larry Chung on uh, repeat guest. Always a pleasure to talk to him. And we're going to talk all things China, which is particularly relevant given the massive stimulus measures that they have been taking lately. Yeah. And um, we're scrap. We usually do defend the tech, but we wanted to make enough time for Larry because um, usually there's a lot of good things to talk about and we learn a lot when he comes on. So um, we'll, we'll save um, the latest version of, um, you know, the latest installment of us saying something that, that necessitates us eating hot sauce by the end of the year uh, till next week. Um, number one, as you mentioned in the big three jobs report came in and it was good. First time, in three months, in the last two months, you know, it's been sort of disturbing, disturbing how how short jobs numbers were of expectations. Um, 
there's 159k uh in august it's revised up i believe uh and it was what was it 120 120 something thousand or no not thousands do so the yeah. release today uh there were 254,000 254 today and yeah. the unemployment rate ticked down to 4.1%. So the headline is that the jobs report crushed it. Yeah, 150,000 expect, expected. Yeah. 254 came in. So, but I, what was the the bad one 2 months ago was like 125 or so 120 119 119. Maybe? So that's quite a quite a jump. Uh the market's like it. It's, you know, they're not taking off at least yet um but you know in a week with there's all the other turmoil that we're going to talk about dock worker strike middle east um election uncertainty uh sort of a nice it's one less thing for the market to worry about at least for now um and it's really it's been the thing that they've been most worried about and it's sort of I sh- obviously it has nothing to do with you know this biggest spike has nothing to, to do with the Fed with the Fed's you know cutting interest rates yet maybe because no. that just happened um but it's sort of it 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 erases the concern I guess that that the Fed was too late um even with 50 basis point cut last month. You know, I think that's probably no longer a, a concern. Um, and in fact, people have gone from expecting um, that they cut another 50 basis points in November, as early as November, to now that's, uh, there's just like 95%, I think, that they're expecting a uh, 25 basis point qu- cut in November. You and I had forecast no cut in November. Yep. Uh, we, we might be wrong again there. Um but it seems like you know they might go a little slower now uh, than possibly they may have uh, before today's report. Yeah, I think that's the only the only thing that's even like remotely approaching bad news that you can take out of it is right. that okay, this slows the the Fed's pace a little bit. Um, but all things considered, it's a good report. I mean, like obviously with the impact of the hurricane when we get that that next set of figures you know there could be some one off job losses there that'll be a concern you know it's too early to have impacted or to have matriculated into the september numbers obviously since it's you know just hit but th- there is there are still some sort of waves on the horizon but i think for the time being it's uh better than expected good news is good news the economy remains stronger than I think a lot of people are giving it credit for. Um, you know, still plenty of anecdotal conversation around job losses hitting tech. Uh, automation in general is is has become more of a point of contention, and that's something that that the dock workers who are coming off of their brief one day strike, at least till till January, and we'll we'll get into that more. Uh, something that they are concerned about, and I think something that a lot of people are concerned about, just sort of operating in the background, is all right. Well, how far is AI automation? How much is that going to affect uh, the employment picture? But all things considered, good week, good week for jobs. Yeah, and when you consider that that was the thing that. That was, the jobs numbers from I can't remember if they reported like last day of July or first first couple of days of August. The the first one that really sent shockwaves not only here but had the domino effect of the uh, the carry trade in uh, in Japan uh, that sent Japanese stock market down what like twelve percent in a day yeah. or something like that. And then subsequently, the domino effect came back to the U.S. stocks and stocks bottomed. Uh, at the end of the first week of August, uh, S&P down eight and a half percent and NASDAQ down uh, 13, 14 percent from its highs. Um, so that was like a major concern then. Um, the biggest concern probably we've seen all year, um, at least concern that showed up in, you know, how people traded. Uh, yeah, and that was the that was the jobs report in, in July that that prompted a lot of speculation that had. Powell and the Fed seen it ahead of the meeting that they right, would have yeah. cut in July instead of right. uh, waiting for the subsequent cut in September. Right. Um, and that's the theory behind 
why yeah. they cut 50 basis points like to, right you know, they saw that report and the and the next month's report and the the august report which is also underwhelming uh less maybe less underwhelming but still missed expectations and you know feds so sort of like okay we're putting our foot on the gas here uh yeah but this shows that maybe they weren't they weren't too late you know they weren't they didn't totally miss the boat it doesn't seem yeah, I I mean, to a degree, it feels like we have been white knuckling some of the economic data points lately, where we put we got right up to the li- right up to the limit for how long the Fed could hold on on yeah. taking action. And now that they've cut, it's you know we're just holding on for dear life. Like, did they do enough? Is this enough? Did you know have yep. are, are these appropriate steps that they're taking? But it does feel like with some of the la- the latest data points that we're backing off a little bit not quite redlining as much. Um, yeah. So I, I don't know. I think it's a, I think it sets a, sets the stage well going yeah. into the end of the year. I mean, it's only October 4th. We've still got four weeks for an October surprise of some sort to hit. Should yeah. that happen? But uh, yeah, there's, there's still other things out there. Um, thankfully one of them also, this has been a good morning, hasn't it? Uh, an, another big one sort of came off the board. Uh, the dock workers strike um, that affected uh, ports from Maine to Texas. Um, dock workers union wanted 70. The next six years, it's been settled, at least temporarily. They got 62% over the next yep. six, six years. Uh, so they put the strike on hold, at least until, I think it's January 15th. They yes. still want to talk about, as you mentioned, I think AI, um, what its role is, and you know, essentially taking away jobs from dark workers. Um, but it's off, it's off the table. Have a great morning for... Um, You'd almost feel like there's some uh, political influences here uh, between the really good jobs report and the dock worker strike going on hold. Uh, both good news for potentially for the the Harris campaign, uh, but um, we'll leave that for a political podcast. Um, how big do you think a concern this was, uh, at least for the market? Um, you know, supply chain, uh, supply chain is a, is a, you know, sort of a four, four syllable word, uh, or has been at times yeah. the last few years since, since COVID. And that was something that it was threatening. Um, but now that's at least temporarily off the table. How big a concern do you think it was for the market and how big a deal do you think it being, you know, temporarily settled is for the market now? You know, it, it, the estimate was that it would cost something like five billion a day to the economy. Uh, yeah. Had the strike been prolonged or, or protracted, um, so there's obviously like an ec- economic impact there. But I I do think that part of it is just the psychological effect of us coming off of COVID and COVID shutdowns and being more acutely aware of the fragility of the supply chain you know, within the, within the U S domestically, like not like there's one supply chain, but sort of the Royal supply chain. Um, so I, I think that we were probably a little bit hypersensitive to that. And that goes back to some of that feeling like we're white knuckling the economy a bit as we get into those, into the final stretches of, is this a recovery? Is the fed too late? All that. All right. I think we had a little technical difficulties there at the end of our uh, dock workers discussion, but I think we we said what we wanted to say. Um, let's move on to to number three in our big three, and that is Nike. Uh, Nike took another big hit uh, after earnings uh, in recent days. Stock is down twenty four percent year to date, ten percent down ten percent in the last five years. Nike growth has completely stalled uh, the last couple of years. Um, let's see it. Uh, so it topped out at 50 billion uh in revenue um 50 sorry 51.4 billion in revenue uh in the latest fiscal year they're they're now on fiscal year 2025 uh their fiscal year ends at uh, end of may um so for the last fiscal year 24 fiscal year 51.4 billion dollars um barely up from 51.2 the year before and this year, they're forecasting growth 
or sorry, no growth. Uh, revenue is supposed to come in around the 47 billion range. So backtracking. What happened at Nike? Why? Why are they? Before it was just their stock was struggling. Uh, and now it's the company is not only not growing, but but reverting. Well, I think one one important thing to call out just in regards to that ten percent drop off. They also uh, delayed their investor day. That's a that's bad optics in the short term, yeah. yeah. Right, like that because that draws into question maybe what some of their long term planning is going to look like. Um, they're also now going through a, a CEO transition yeah. uh, in mid October, so that adds some some short term volatility. Um, I do think that Nike is sort of uniquely positioned to feel the pain of the economy that we're in right now where we've got, you know, the, we're coming off a period where we had a ton of stimulus that prompted the kind of purchases that Nike benefits from, right? Like if I get a stim stimulus check, Hey, maybe instead of when I need new shoes, maybe instead of buying Keds or whatever, I buy the Jordans. Um, and they, they benefit when people feel very flush with cash in a period like we've got now where people are, you know, despite signs of a lot of economic strength, still feeling the the knock-on impacts of high inflation, grocery prices are still high. It's just a lot tougher to justify going out and, and buying the latest pair of Jordans or buying new dunk lows or whatever. Um, and also the where we're seeing job losses is predominantly in like the affluent middle class, especially tech focused areas of the market. And the 40 year old tech bro is the guy that's going to go out and is going to buy the highly sought after sneakers. They're the ones that are going to participate in the secondary market for shoes. Right. So there's a, there's a lot of perception damage that that Nike probably takes just as a consequence of the the economy feeling a little bit more tenuous than it it may actually be. So I don't know. I mean, I, we're going to have Larry Chung on after this, and we're going to talk to him about about China. Um, I don't know if maybe some of the consum consumption patterns globally are also changing, uh, but certainly in the U.S., it's just a tough spot for somebody that's very consumer discretionary driven when consumers aren't feeling quite as optimistic as maybe they should be, especially on something that is not an essential, something like a pair of Nike shoes that may cost twice what we would get for something of comparable quality. And that's not even to speak of market share changes with other competitors in the marketplace. Yeah, that's what I was going to mention. It seems like, you know, the, the become the competition has increased in the in the market has become more fragmented. You know, it, Nike still does have um 38, 39 percent uh market share, you know, the dominant um, market share in sports apparel, but that hasn't changed much in recent years. Um, you know, whereas Nike used to be this, you know, fast growing, exciting, I mean, it hasn't been new for a long time, but, um, you know, it's still sort of cool, um, way, you know, when it was competing, say in the nineties with like Reebok and Converse, which it now owns, um, Nike was cool. Those weren't, well, now there's all kinds of other, there's Under Armour, um, and there's, even uh, Cabot favorite uh, on hold on on holdings, uh, which what do you call those shoes? Is just on? I think they're on. just ons. I've, on, on. I right? don't know yeah. if I've ever seen a pair of those. Neither have I, but I know it's doing well, uh, and I know some people like it. Uh, like all all birds, I guess that's maybe a little bit a little bit different sandbox than than Nike um, and um, Lululemon. Uh, it's been you know it's been around a while too, but that that's you know at least prevented Nike from taking over much more market share and, you know, combine that with sort of low consumer or lower consumer sentiment um, market, uh, you know, a less, less fervor, less fervent uh, retail climate. And yeah, it's almost like Nike's, I'm sure it hasn't tapped out for good, uh, but it seems no. like they need to start, Sort of at a crossroads where where Apple was maybe a few years ago, where they need they need to start doing some new things to sort of re reinvigorate growth, or they need to be the beneficiary of just like a high flying bull market and a yes. ton of consumer spending. 
Yes. So it, it seems like they're just kind of stuck in a spot where it's like the athletic, the athletic apparel segment, they're facing more competitors and more viable competitors. And then on the uh, cultural cachet front, yeah. they're, they're suffering through some weaker consumer spending. So, yeah, I, I would agree. I'm probably not buying Nike hand over fist right now. I'm probably, you know, it's probably more on my watch list waiting for for one of those two things, either. Um, yeah innovation from them or just a more favorable environment overall yeah you could say you know hey i can buy nike this major company at these depressed prices after but after five years of no gain of losses it's re- reached the prove it stage i think you, know. where you got to see some life before you're going to jump into that thing um okay uh now let's shift uh to our guest for this week uh, we will bring on a uh, frequent uh, street check guest and Chinese stock expert, uh, Larry Chung. All right. We welcome on friend of the street check podcast, Larry Chung. Uh, Larry runs uh, letters for Larry Substack newsletter. Um, and you can find his very popular YouTube channel under Larry Chung CFA. Uh, Larry, we've had you on periodically to discuss all things, China, Chinese stocks. You have a very you know, in depth and unique perspective there. And no, there's been no better time, at least since we've been had this, we've been, we've had this podcast to have you on than now. Uh, and that's, of course, because of the massive Chinese uh, stimulus uh, that occurred, was it about nine, 10 days ago now? Um, and during that time, the Hang Seng uh, index is up 25 to 28%, depending on intraday versus end of day uh, measurements. Um, among the the stimulus measures, you know, they cut the benchmark interest rate, uh, they cut bank reserve ratios, uh, existing mortgage rates, fifty basis point reduction. Um, I believe it's. I read that for the year, uh, it amounts to what seven point five trillion yuan or one point seven trillion dollars worth uh, of stimulus, six uh, percent of the country's GDP this year. What of all? The stimulus measures uh, or the actions the Chinese government took, um, what do you think is the most meaningful? Sure. So uh, in the past two weeks, we have had a very, very, I'll use the word insane rally uh, across uh, Hang Seng and the China CSI index. And this is because of you know two big measures, one on the monetary uh, easing side, and then one on the fiscal side. So I actually uh, just re- released a, a YouTube video today on the specific details, uh, but I'm going to give some really nice uh, big picture uh, observations uh, for, for listeners here today. So yep. on the monetary easing side, uh, I have in my notes here that uh, the PBOC governor, they are having an initial swap facility of 500 billion won. And that what that's going to do in plain English is it's going to help increase liquidity and access for the equity markets because that capital to tap that swap facility, it can only be used for the stock market. And then the PBOC governor, his name is Pan Gong Sheng, he and his team are actively researching, implementing a stock market stabilization fund. And why that's important is after a very volatile, uncertain, shaky period in Chinese stocks over the last couple of years, where most of the price action has been characterized by longer term declines, while bear market rallies have been violent, they, they tend to be faded. This stock market stabilization fund is basically in, it's basically a policy put that could set a baseline for valuations going forward. So uh, the big picture concept is that we know that China ADRs uh, have traded at a substantial valuation premium compared to U.S. stocks. That valuation premium uh, discount will continue to exist because of the geopolitical risk. But from here on out, it could be narrowed. And that means that the valuation ban that stocks like Pinduoduo, Alibaba, JD have traded in, uh, it could be in a structurally slightly higher band than before. So we know that Alibaba has typically traded uh, ridiculous <laughs> uh, valuation multiples like eight times forward P or nine times forward mm-hmm. P. Going forward, that baseline may be 10 and a half 
11, 12, still low relative to U.S. stocks, but compared to where it usually trades, that, that's a that's a 30, 40 percent markup. And that's explains the kind of uh, bump that we've seen uh, in China ADRs. So on the uh, monetary easing side, uh, the way I like to describe it to people who may not understand the internal workings is this. Let's say that an institutional portfolio doesn't add any more capital to, to their fund. Their buying power has actually increased. Right. Their, uh, their access to credit margin has increased. So for instance, let's say us as individual retail investors, you know, in our portfolio, our buying power is, is associated with our current account value. But imagine a situation where our account value stays the same, but our buying power has increased. Right. Right. Like our ability to use margin for better or for worse has increased. Our access to credit has increased. That That's what's going on in today's uh, environment after the monetary uh, stimulus. So th that essentially means that all this new access to credit, and by the way, it can only be used for investing in the stock market. So if you know, these institutional investors want to take advantage of that, all channeling of those funds are going into the stock market, not the property market, not, you know, a private equity, not VC, public, public stock markets. Yeah. So, so there's that. Is that. Is that likely, I mean, like, all right, me asking you to predict this or to, to have yeah. a take on this is probably a little bit unfair. Is that likely to trickle down to retail investors in any fashion? Because you know, one of the early measures of the stimulus uh, was a reduction in down payment requirement for for investment properties, which obviously sort of more, better aligns with the the saving style of most retail investors in China, where it's it's property forward. Is are some of these actions that are going to juice institutional buying likely to maybe in the next couple of years also increase? retail investing in China or individual investing in China? Or is that something that's still maybe a bridge too far? So uh, I'm going to give you uh, uh, like my opinion on this, even though yes. obviously nobody knows. Right. Um, and my opinion comes from the fact that retail investors make up a pretty large amount of trading volume uh, in China on share, uh, you know, A share markets. Uh, and also in the Hang Seng H share markets. So here in the U.S., institutional activity dominates all the flows. Uh, in China, retail activity is much more significant. So there is the potential that that will happen. But the way I think about it is if we think about how China's policymakers released the stimulus developments, we may have noticed that they didn't do it all at once, right? They did it day after day after day after day, and 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 then why 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 are policymakers doing that? It's because it's because they don't want just one giant recovery session. Mm -hmm. They want multiple like recovery sessions that shift the market structure to be bullish, and and by doing that, they're trapping a significant amount of short positions because you know in the past we we may have seen. China rallies be, you know, one time, one time events, may, maybe yeah. two time events, right? And then it fades, right? Um, and so hedge funds, uh, quantitative funds, there's actually an article on Bloomberg talking about how significant, significant number of margin calls happening because of this rally. So this rally isn't actually only causing wealth recovery and wealth creation, it's actually causing uh, capital destruction mm -hmm. uh, for for uh, institutional uh, investors that have been short China for a long time, because there's a lot of capital um, that have been committed to uh, betting against China's currency, uh, the yuan, betting yep. against, especially betting against the Hang Seng H shares, because it's it's more difficult to get access to onshore A share markets. So there's just a significant amount of, um, uh, we'll say capital that, that, that was caught off sides by this policy announcement. And because of the way policymakers dripped it, dripped it, you know, day by day and not all at once, a significant amount of unraveling is happening as we speak. So right now it's not just organic buying, it's 
it's it's a gigantic gigantic short squeeze moves in this in this velocity um can't really be just uh produced by organic buying yeah uh, this this is this is panic buying this is panic uh short covering buying sounds like you're pretty well I'll, I'll let you say are you are you pretty optimistic that that all the measures taken are, are you know as you mentioned there's been some fits and starts with chinese stocks uh seems like you you're optimistic these are a little bit more this is more sustainable this rally is more sustainable than than some of those what we've seen the past couple of years from the hong sang for instance right right and 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 the way i would think about that is uh when we see announcements from uh china's policymakers using phrases like you know they vow to do this and 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 they vow to do that um and they that's them setting the stage for future concrete action right but that's not them doing the action at that point in time and because of that timeline and that sequence um capital is not necessarily going to be deployed on the bullish side at that at that moment but this time around there are policies that are being implemented in a way that is that is changing the landscape and because the landscape is changing um i am more i am more structurally bullish this time uh before i i did talk about how china is a trade uh and any rallies are very cyclical uh per se uh but this time i'll give an example on the fiscal stimulus side um you know for uh, on the fiscal stimulus side china uh, is issuing 2 trillion worth of yuan to uh, stimulate consumption in terms of sovereign bonds. So when we think about them issuing bonds in at that scale, you know, that's very nice to say at the headline level and that's somewhat reassuring on, on, for investors, but it may not flow down to the consumer, but this time as a part of that fiscal stimulus, I have in my notes here, the government is going to give uh, 800 renminbi of monthly allowance for families with two or more children. Now that is actionable, right? When 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 we read that there's two trillion worth of uh, sovereign bonds being issued, you know most people may or may not know what to do with that, right? Yeah. Uh, but when, when you say that families with two or more children, as a part of that stimulus package, is going to get eight hundred renminbi monthly uh, allowance, especially for families in tier three cities. 800 renminbi is very meaningful. And in tier three cities uh, that contributes 60% of national GDP, that 800 of monthly allowance is, is going to go a long way for uh, consumer staple purchases, you know, a little bit of you know, discretionary purchases, you know, definitely not enough for big ticket purchases for EV or, or luxury items, but you know, staples, right? Like educational services, mm -hmm. uh, which is why I like new oriental and every time new oriental gets to a swing low i i like this name because educational services is ingrained in chinese culture families have a little bit extra to spend where's it going to go education staples if there's a little bit more discretionary savings travel which is why trip.com tcom is you know is, is is one of the more sustainable names uh with, within this rally you're going to see that pullbacks within uh staples like alibaba jd New Oriental uh, and modestly discretionary names like TCOM, you're, you're going to see that their rallies are larger and their pullbacks are shorter in duration and they're more shallow versus versus uh, big ticket names uh, like EV companies, Neo, Liado, Xiaoping. Obviously, the stimulus package, more people are going to, you know, drive drive EV. But but here's the thing. Because the stimulus isn't designed to make people go from, say, middle class to upper class, you know, no government can do mm -hmm. that. Um, you're going to see pullbacks in the EV sector uh, be a little bit more severe, per se. Is, is the uptrend there? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Right. The but, high, but, higher floor now sounds like for, for everything. Next right. The, there's a higher floor for everything. But but the pullback, uh, the degree the nature of it, the velocity, right? The timeline of that pullback uh, is going to be different depending on where the stimulus money is going. Um, so, so that's so that's how I that's how I think about how the monetary stimulus and the fiscal stimulus is is like uh, going across, you know, these different sectors. 
Yeah, it, it you know something that Chris and I talked about last week, sort of in the early stages of the the stimulus measures, um, was you know whether what at the time were institutional stimulus measures would would end up trickling through to to consumers, and it sounds like very that's something that that policymakers were very sensitive to and have taken really concrete steps on. It's um, you know it. We have seen our our fair share of stimulus in the sort of post COVID and COVID world, but even you know something that's akin to um, a significant tax cut or a UBI to to middle class to lower class families. I, I mean that's that's really significant stimulus, and um, you know I I think you make a really compelling case that that China is seeing something of a re rate where it raises that floor. But I did want to ask what your take is on the youth unemployment picture, mm -hmm. because that that's something that we, you and I have talked about a couple of times where, you know, youth un unemployment was relatively high. Um, the policymakers stopped reporting the figures or reporting in a granular way. And I'm curious if that, if you're seeing any kind of meaningful changes there, or if you've not seeing as, as if you're immediately on the ground, but if you've come across any data that supports uh, meaningful changes there or anything along those lines. Okay. Yes. So believe it or not, I like, it is my observation that this monetary stimulus and this fiscal stimulus is, was, was really sparked actually by the employment situation. Mm -hmm. So before uh, we got this big news from the PBOC on monetary easing and, and the fiscal stimulus, just a couple of days before that, uh, China released uh, this uh, news development here, which, which I want which I want to share with you. So, on September fifteenth, uh, China's Central Committee and State Council issued public guidelines to promote employment, and there were a total of twenty four points that they addressed. It's not fully publicly disclosed, but these twenty four points they include fiscal taxation, financial, social security, and other policies to help entities expand employment. So they gave that guideline out two days before their monetary easing announcement from PBOC Governor Pen Gongsheng. So uh, we all know about the monetary stimulus news, the fiscal stimulus news, but really uh, just a couple of days before this massive bazooka uh, stimulus was announced to the public, um, the, you know, public announcements were made from policymakers to address their concerns on the employment situation. So that now ties me back to answering your question that youth unemployment is a problem. Uh, there, it's, it's not going to be a quick fix. It's right. not just, it's not going to be fixed in six months, nine months, or, or honestly, even a year. Uh, so the youth unemployment um, continues to be very elevated. Finding a job in China uh, as a post-college graduate is more difficult than before. Um, obviously, there are still opportunities, but the landscape is more selective. It's more challenging than before, and, and that leads to a higher youth unemployment rate. So uh, will this stimulus uh, be the solution to you know, create a peak, per se, in the youth unemployment? I believe that it has the ability to create a peak in this in this figure will yeah. it be the catalyst that drives it down and mean reverts it back to say right now it's 25 22 25 percent based on estimates is this is this the event that drives it back to 16 18 percent in a short period of time no no I, I don't believe so uh but this is the event that most likely can mark the peak in this macro data point, right? So this is the data, this is the stimulus that uh, that will prevent the youth unemployment from going to 30, 35%. Right. right? Or even going to, you know, 26, 28%, right? And, and by cutting the tail risk off, that in itself is the first uh, priority I, I think policymakers can practically do. So what they've done here is they've cut off the tail risk. And why do I say that? Because with this stimulus announcement, the probability that companies in China are going to do mass layoffs just massively decreased, right? Yeah. Like if you're a if you're a a leader, a management leader at uh, you know one of the big tech companies in in China or on you know the like different industries, travel, EV, right? Like you see China come up with this policy announcement, how they how they kind of encourage companies to. Um, 
expand their employment. If, if they see your company is reducing headcount, you could be hit with a fine. One of with, with 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 their public guidance that companies should stabilize headcount, companies that are reducing headcount without a real like recessionary cause, they could be viewed unfavorably uh, by by the government. And and we know what that means when 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 right. companies are viewed unfavorably by policymakers. So at the very least, uh, I. I think that this data points to the tail risk of the employment situation being cut off. It marks most likely the peak of the unemployment crisis. It's not the magic pill that will make everybody employed and very economically comfortable. No government can do that right away. Uh, but I would say, I can say with confidence that the worst of the job market and the worst of the economic situation as it relates to the property market and the stock market is probably behind us. So yeah. that I can, that I can say, and what I know that's a very bold kind of <laughs> opinion. Um, but you know, I don't really like to hedge my language, uh, sure, unless, yeah. unless, unless there's like really like significant uncertainty with all this data coming out, um, at the very, at the very minimum, I can say the worst is behind us. Yeah, it certainly, you know, it certainly feels that way from what what we've seen. And, and I think the economic case is there. Um, you know, when we when we saw similar, uh, excuse me, sim similar direct stimulus measures in the U.S. post COVID, yes. it it ended up prompting a lot of consumption spending, which was good for service sector employment in particular. Is this, I mean, it also prompted net saving, but is is this stimulus measure sort of a tacit acceptance that being a little bit more consumption driven economically is acceptable? Because I know that that is something that, that Xi Jinping and that the party have been sort of opposed to is the idea of converting China into a Western style consumption driven economy. Is it just, is it a tacit, tacit acceptance of some of that? Isn't it acknowledgement of, you know, that being a necessity if if you have meaningful quality of life improvements? Where do you have a stance on that? I do. I I, I do. Um, so markets have rebounded. Confidence uh, is uh, healed a little bit. But the philosophy behind how uh, China's leaders want to run the country, I think, will not change. So mm -hmm. what I mean by this is... Um, the last couple of years have seen a very big pivot from the way consumers uh, buy things in general. Uh, you know, there's a little bit more um, of a preference for domestic brands. So even if uh, consumers are going to have greater purchasing power, I believe that that uh, discretionary spending savings is going to go towards national brands. So what I mean by that from an investment standpoint is, you know, Euro luxury names, European luxury names like LVMH mm -hmm. also saw uh, a proxy rally from China. And I, and I traded that LVMH like rally because it, it hadn't run up in the same extent that China stocks did. But, but that rally is not going to be as sustainable as a mainland China stock rally or a China ADR stock rally. And, and, and the reason I say that is just because China's economy improves doesn't mean that consumers are going to buy like foreign brands because because mm -hmm. the way the geopolitical climate has just changed like how us uh you know folks view ex us people and how china uh, citizens like view uh you know us um it it hasn't really gone in the right direction and i hope it does go in the right direction because that would be beneficial for everyone but 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 how, but how, like citizens uh, in, you know, each other's countries view each other, it, it's changed, um, and so uh, because of that, consumption uh, improvement is going to likely flow into domestic oriented brands. So, um, you know, if 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 you if you take a look at some uh, retail companies with heavy China exposure, like Lululemon. Uh, mm -hmm. LVMH, right? You're going to see that there are rallies 
that they rallied at the same time that China ADRs did, but but they faded. Yeah, but China ADRs didn't. Yeah, and and I think that that's a direct um, kind of reflection of of how consumption patterns will be. And investors who follow this space very closely, I think they know that. Um, and and I think that they are very quick to see that proxy rallies are are less are less durable um, than than the ADR rallies or the H share rallies themselves. Uh, last question, uh, you know, so as we mentioned, Hong Seng up 25, 28 percent in the last couple of weeks since all these stimulus stimulus measures um, for someone who's. People who who haven't owned Chinese stocks or or now you know have sort of peaked their interest. This is sort of peaked their interests. Do you recommend waiting for dips in the market to get in, or do you think that this is you know such a sustainable rally doesn't doesn't really matter? You know you can jump in now on some of the names you mentioned: PDD, New Oriental, JD, um, whatever. And I guess if so, are there some that you prefer over others? You mentioned New Oriental as being one of them. Um, what, what are your thoughts? Sure. Um, the 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 main way I'm going to answer this question is it always has to do with the time frame, right? It always has to do with the time frame. So there's short term, less than 30 days, intermediate term, multi week, multi month, long term, more than a year. So I'm going to answer this question based on the time frame so that yep. it makes sense uh, to the to the people who are you know interested in this market, not yet in, maybe in, maybe want to add more, right? Depending on their situation. So let's talk about the short term less than 30 days. Yeah. When, when we think about the short term, uh, things have gone parabolic, right? Um, things have gone parabolic. Momentum indicators uh, are off the charts, very, very overbought, um, but it's still a very bullish situation. So in the short term, um, the macro picture is as follows. In China, there's a significant, significant number of people who are trying to open up brokerages uh, because they want to buy stocks, A shares, H shares, get a piece, get a piece of the pie, right? And because of that, that means brokerage companies like Futu Holdings and HKEX, the Hong Kong exchange, right? Uh, ticker is, uh, I believe it's 0388, HK0388 for HKEX, correct me if I'm wrong later. Um, you know, those two companies are positioned to take advantage of incoming new accounts, uh, that are being created because of this market boom. So the big picture is a lot of people look at the market. They're they're thinking they want to they want they want in. How do they get in? Well, they need to open up a brokerage. They need to trade, pay commission fees. Biggest beneficiary of that are the brokerages, Futu Holdings and um, and HKS. Now, in the short term, these two companies still have room to run. And why is that? It, it's because there's no indication that new account openings is slowing down. Perhaps the growth rate will obviously fade at some point, but the number of people opening up accounts and being active in the market is 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 increasing. And longer term, I, I don't I don't see that trend reversing structurally. So from a short term perspective, there's more upside. From a long term perspective, on a deeper pullback. It's a it's a it's a, it's a it's a reload entry for higher for from a long term standpoint on those names. So in the short term, big picture on the Hang Seng on on you know the China ADRs, big part of the upside uh, has ha, 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 has happened. Um, I'll, I'll also give my DCF model perspective. Believe it or not, in these three weeks, China ADRs. From Alibaba, Pinduoduo, New Oriental, JD, they went from my DCF bear case to my bull case in three weeks. Wow. Yeah. So I I model very you know stressed scenarios for the bear case. I also model you know modestly optimistic scenarios for the bull case. It went from bear case to bull case in three weeks. So wow. you know if th th that's how I give my you know equity forecast for for individual stocks, I, I have to rely on my DCF model. So so. Uh, for for stocks that have gone from bear case to bull case in three weeks, like should they chase it in the short term? I mean, if they're very skilled at technical analysis and they can find the window where they can reload higher for, you know, two to six percent, yes, of course, there's two to six percent left. But is it is it going to do another fifty percent in the next three weeks? Uh, that's that's more of the 
the long term answer. Yeah. Right? So so moving into the the intermediate term to long term time frame, which I'll just group together. Um, there's more upside from here. Yeah. So plain and simple, there's more upside from here. Um, after the fiscal stimulus announcement was released, Hang Seng traded towards that 21,000 level. Uh, and I released a note to our community saying, ba based on based on fiscal stimulus, based on valuation, if the gap closes and there's consumption and it shows up in earnings estimates, that's the most important part, right? It's not just about fiscal stimulus and getting everybody excited. It has to show up in earnings estimates. It has to show up in company profitability. Otherwise, otherwise it's just multiple expansion, right? Right. right. So, so um, our opinion is that Hang Seng, by end of 2025, it could get to 25,000 to 28,000. So we made that comment when Hang Seng was 21 and a few days later it went to 22.5K, the index, you know, sort of another 1500 points. So for, for the index to get to 25,000, 28,000, based on a combination of improved sentiment, improved earnings estimates, uh, a structural floor, uh, you know, lower geopolitical tensions, getting to 25,000 HSI, Hang Seng is just another 10% away. That's, if the market really wants to do it, it can get there like in several weeks. I'm being more conservative and giving that price target for an end of year 2025 level because um, there's going to be a correction uh, after a, a rally uh, to this extent. So from a long-term standpoint, it's a buy. Uh, where do we enter? I would say that fund managers tend to evaluate uh, re-entries at the 5 to 10% threshold in terms of a retracement. Right. Um, the rally has gone so parabolic, though, that I, I, I have to not just look at a 5 to 10% threshold. Uh, we have to use perhaps a like a, six, like a Fibonacci retracement. Uh, kind of analysis where, where you know, if the rally retraces 33% <laughs> of, of the current level, that's where I would become a little bit more bold to say that that's a buy the crater opportunity. Um, right. Because entering, here's the, the way I think about it is if the Hang Seng say right now is 21.5K and the, and the target is 25K, that's, that's 15, 18% ROI right from here yeah but if it retraces to 20k or 19.5k and the target is unchanged at 25k then then the roi is closer to 25 27 percent so so really uh the target is higher i think we're going to go higher the the fundamentals are improving there's no doubt about that it's just then about if someone buys it locks it away doesn't look at it what's the roi if someone buys too close to the recent top, well, they're going to see some drawdown before they yeah. before they're able to have like a realized gain at HSI twenty five thousand, HSI twenty eight thousand. Um, so I, I do think that we do have to be patient. Um, I, I don't think that investors have ever really been rewarded by FOMOing at the top. Right. <laughs> uh, I I think that there's absolutely long term upside. Uh, the art then is to find a careful entry uh, in conservative ways because we we could be wrong, right? Policymakers could say, okay, you know what? We've created an asset bubble. It's back to common prosperity. Uh, it's back to um, it's back to you know like consumption in a way that's very. Uh, conservative well then in that case hsi can reverse half its rally in the next month it can happen it, it really can so yeah. so i think we've seen that china is a place where anything can happen um and and i and, and out of fairness my dcf models work best on the china adrs that are listed in the u.s because there's earnings estimates on those companies and you right. can't do dcf models without earnings estimates and yeah. profitability estimates you just can't do dcf models without that critical info, right? Um, but on H shares, uh, which drive the HSI, I don't have access to earnings estimates for, for those companies. Um, I, you know, I use, you know, like the platforms I use, which are already very, very 
powerful like Y charts, they don't have earnings estimates on H shares because they trade OTC here in the US. They don't have earnings right. estimates. So, yep. so my forecast uh, for US ADRs is based on DCF models, right? Tried and true bear base bull cases. My estimates for HSI and H shares relies on macro. It, it relies on uh, my observation of policy developments and, and technical analysis. And it's much harder to do DCF on, on to, 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 to do a forecast on HSI. So that's why I have such a big range, 25,000 to 28,000. Yeah. Very difficult to pinpoint with precision how that's going to look like. But I think optimism prevails um, if, if uh, we have a long enough time frame. Yeah, it's good to see you. I was going to say, it's good to see you come on here and be optimistic and have a pep in your step. Uh, I'm happy for you <laughs> that, you know, there's there's something to be really excited about with, with Chinese stocks now, clearly. And we're seeing that excitement play out in the last couple of weeks, you know, regardless of whether there's a pullback, seems like odds are, as you discussed, um, that it'll be even higher, perhaps much higher uh, a year from now. Um, so thanks again for coming on and sort of doing a deep dive with all this on us. Uh, we, we learn something every time you come on. Um, and that was no different this time. Again, uh, people can find Larry, uh, Larry Chung CFA is his YouTube page. That's C H E U N G, uh, is, uh, Larry Chung, um, and letters from Larry Substack newsletter. Correct. Um, and then Larry Chung, uh, CFA at Larry Chung CFA is your Twitter X handle. Um, anything I missed, uh, no, I mean, you know, thanks so much, Chris and Brad, for having me. And um, you know, I hope uh, you know all of your all of your positions, U.S. and China, Europe, right, global <laughs> stuff. They all do very well. Uh, I, you know, I, I don't just I'm not just bullish on China. I think you know, global global stimulus from China helps everybody. It's it's good for right. everybody, right? Like it's good for U.S. stocks. It's good for European stocks. It's good for China stocks. So, um, you know, I hope, uh, I hope, you know, all of you guys like do really well and, um, you know, everyone <laughs> listening to this uh, does, does really well. Thanks. That's a good, good optimistic tone, uh, to, to end on, uh, we appreciate you joining us and we appreciate everyone joining us on, uh, this episode of Street Check.